recording started. Good afternoon and welcome to this, the eighth and final session in the year-long series, Reaching Every Learner, Differentiating Instruction in Theory and in Practice. I'm Bobby Hobgood and along with my colleagues Emily Jack and Leslie Richardson, we're happy to bring this series to you, a series of web conferences based on the articles that appear on the Learn North Carolina website. Today's session is devoted to the article by Joan Barnett, The Power of Nonfiction Using Informational Text to Support Literacy in Special Populations. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Joan and also to Paul Miles, who is one of our featured speakers this afternoon, and let them introduce themselves. And we'll take it from there. Uh, when they finish, we'll have the opportunity for questions from our participants participants from around the state of North Carolina. Um, I'm happy to acknowledge that Joan is at Elon University and we have participating with us this afternoon the Teaching Fellows Program at Elon University. So uh, a great uh, coincidence that they're both here. So I'd ask everyone to join me in a virtual round of applause and to welcome Dr. Joan Barnett and Mr. Paul Miles. Joan? Thank you. My name is Joan Barnett, and I'm an assistant professor of education at Elon University, where I serve as the middle grades coordinator. And I also teach elementary and social studies methods courses to undergraduates, as well as literacy to master's level students in teacher education. In the not too distant past, though, I was a teacher in middle grades and upper elementary classrooms where I taught English language arts, social studies, and science. I do have my national board certification in social studies, and I've also worked in curriculum development for more than 10 years now. And I'm joined today by a master teacher in Massachusetts who was also my mentor in the past, Mr. Paul Niles. Thank you, Joan. It's great to be with, with you today. And, uh, and hello to uh, everyone down in North Carolina. Uh, as Joan said, my name is Paul Niles, and I've had the privilege of working with Joan in the past. And I've been a, a middle school science teacher for about a quarter of a century. And I've been involved in curriculum and assessment development uh, for the last 15 of those professional years. And uh, I still do teach in an eighth grade science classroom, uh, even as I serve as interim director of the Cape Cod Lighthouse Charter School. And for the 25 years that I've been teaching, uh, informational text has become a more and more important piece of my classroom ritual. Uh, and I've had great success with informational text in promoting uh, learning of very difficult uh, concepts for students. And some of the most successful informational textual elements that I use are uh, there's a great richness of scientific essays and great essayists out there that, uh, that we use. Um, use many graphic selections. Uh, graphics are great elements of informational text that can be uh, scaffolded to, uh, to, to get the uh, most basic elements of a concept and then to build from those graphic explanations. Uh, and we have great success in elective classes. There's an amazing food literature out there that uh, merges with some great scientific uh, concepts. And in the picture there, you, you'll see some uh, Codium Fragile from, from a seaweed distribution project that we did a few years ago. Uh, so, so those are some of the basic areas of my experience that uh, I welcome questions about later. Thanks. So I'd like to start today. Um, by defining terms. We're, we're talking about using nonfiction, specifically informational text, as a means of differentiating to support literacy in special populations. Um, starting to define and clarify our terms, I think, is a good place to start. Nonfiction is the broad term that stands in contrast to any form of fiction. Fiction, of course, being an imaginative creation, and nonfiction being fact-based. Informational text, as used here, specifically includes trade text that goes beyond the use of textbooks and basic reference materials in the classrooms. So in addition to what Paul's mentioned, um, this includes specific books in science, social studies, or the fine arts, 
biographies and autobiography, how-to books, how things work books, even cookbooks. And we can include magazines, periodicals, and now a growing array of web-based media. Additionally, there are informational books made up of narrative text woven through with factual information, sometimes referred to as creative nonfiction, which are increasingly available, um, especially for very young children. I, I'd also like to pinpoint the student populations that we're particularly targeting as benefiting from using informational text, though certainly all students benefit. First, children from low socioeconomic strata are more likely to come to school without the academic language or experiences with literacy than their peers. These are students who are very capable, should be held to high academic standards, but they are at risk of struggling with literacy unless we explicitly attend to gaps, differentiating for these needs and using their strengths. Along the same lines, our English language learners hold great promise as future bilingual adults, but they require different sorts of scaffolding and literacy as they work towards fluency. Specifically, we know academic or content language develops more slowly than conversational language and will need additional um, differentiation um, and attention. And finally, our children with learning disabilities also require differentiation to provide access to curriculum that addresses their varied learning profiles. And I think I've gone too far here. My apologies. Let's go back a bit. OK, so making the case for informational text. It isn't hard to see why informational text is critical in the development of literacy skills when you consider that it is estimated that 86% of reading in adult life is for the purposes of gathering factual information. Yet, research has documented that an average of 3.6 minutes is given over to nonfiction in the average primary classroom. If you need another reason, 50 to 80 percent of all standardized tests target fact-based information. We know that particularly for these target students, differentiating through informational text can move them toward literacy success, the basis for academic success. Informational text provides opportunities to differentiate through interest, learning modes, process, and content, which we should be taking advantage of. Certainly, our task as teachers is in part to have students achieve mastery of literacy skills that provide the best possible life opportunities, but we're also charged with developing a depth and breadth of knowledge and the ability to use that information from content areas in meaningful ways. Early and continued use of informational text deepens and broadens knowledge base to achieve these ends. So right now, I want to talk briefly about three ways that informational text supports these outcomes as mentioned in the article. First, the use of these texts provides for increased engagement. If we can get children to read, they will sharpen reading skills. While we have long used fiction to draw students to the love of reading and learning, the reality is that many of our students prefer nonfiction. So this is a simple means of differentiating by interest as a genre and also by topic. Increasingly, the research is indicating that boys will choose to read proportionately more nonfiction than girls do. And this gives us yet another reason to add informational text to the curriculum in the classroom library, given the number of boys that identify themselves as non-readers. Second, for students struggling with language, informational text, particularly visually rich informational text, can help make connections to their lives that may not come through many of the fictional narratives, thus providing the basis to, to build new understandings. Fictional narrative just does not always provide context or language that is well matched to students in our tar target populations. Concrete, fact-based texts with visual prompts offer different sorts of possibilities for making connections, providing a foundation to build from. 
equally important, these texts are increasingly available in a range of reading levels and by their structure provide measured pieces of information in a format that becomes familiar so that gathering information can be successful and thus more motivating and a rewarding experience. Here we're differentiating through levels of reading, amount of reading, support through visual cues, and providing experiences beyond that three and a half minutes of nonfiction a day. Paul, there's such a difference between elementary and middle grade students in terms of interest and motivation and literacy. I'd really like to hear your thoughts from the middle grade's perspective. Uh, yes, Joan, uh, absolutely. Um, th these, uh, these points that you're making about engagement uh, certainly ring true in the middle school classroom. I can, I can give you uh, one example specifically, uh, and that is a, a project that I do with my middle grade students called the Body Biology Project. And, and each student selects uh, uh, a body system, and they um, develop a way to collect data about that body system over the course of uh, several weeks to a month. Uh, and, for example, many students will choose the skeletal muscular system, and they'll just very simply do a series of exercises and chart their improvement uh, over those exercises over the course of a month. And the real challenge, besides um, data collection and, um, and design, is to understand uh, why their muscles are improving. So they've got to uh, learn about their skeletal muscular system um, and, and how their muscles work and how they contract. Uh, and, and this is fairly complicated stuff for, for middle age learners. And um, the first piece that clearly draws them in is, is, is engagement. So, so to have choice in, in projects um, will certainly differentiate by, by interest. Some students will choose dream projects or will choose to chart their, um, their diet to see uh, whether they're getting enough food groups. So, so interest, uh, differentiating by interest is a very strong motivator. Um, now, to get students to the point where they can understand the, let's say, the, the molecular m mechanisms of muscle contraction uh, takes intense scaffolding. So what I have in the classroom is a series of uh, informational texts at a variety of levels. And, and I start, uh, we, we work on an inclusion model, so uh, about a quarter of our students are, are on educational plans and our special needs students. And I start all students with informational text that's richly graphic so that uh, whether they're trying to understand uh, the way that muscles contract or trying to understand uh, how, um, which areas of your brain control uh, dreaming or how the, the digestive system works, to, to start with uh, graphic text um, really allows an entry point that um, brings all students in. And once they've got that level of understanding, then we graduate up to more sophisticated informational text to the point where it's not unusual for um, students who, uh, who have special needs to be working with, uh, with college level texts. Uh, certainly in a, in a guided inquiry model where there's a teacher there to, uh, to help them interpret the te text, but the, the motivation to, to, to get a student using that vocabulary and, and using that text, it's uh, incredibly motivating for, for those students when they see themselves able to understand that level of text through, uh, through the scaffolding, through the uh, differentiation by interest, certainly through um, part of the entryway is through familiar experiences. Students choose topics that they've had experience with. So all of those elements uh, really work very well in, um, in, in the middle age classroom, in my experience, Joan. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to move along to considering structure and format. And, and I want to highlight here um, that using informational text requires explicitly teaching the unique features of this genre to students. Mrs. Coffey in the video clip that's included with the article does a really nice job of modeling this in her second grade classroom. For the populations we're targeting, walking through the ways to approach informational text can be transforming. They don't necessarily have the experience or the understanding that this is organized in a very particular way that can provide scaffolding for literacy. Stru 
structure and format requires underscoring the differences between illustrations and photos, the use of graphs, grids, organizers, looking at inset information, scanning headings and subheadings, being aware of highlighted or bolded words. Using the table of context or index, students develop very specific literacy skills unique to these books. As instructors, we need to guide them to compare and contrast, look for cause and effect, address different sorts of sequencing. While interacting with informational text, the focus necessarily extends beyond that structure and format, though, to also address comprehension and vocabulary. The sorts of language in informational text is not only more academically bound and content specific, but it uses different descriptive language, and these can form the basis of literacy lessons and discussions. When focusing on comprehension, then we continue to activate background, model summarizing, predicting, questioning, visualizing, evaluating, connecting, all those things that we do with fiction. But these, this format may offer opportunities to take different approaches. For example, what a prediction in fiction and nonfiction have in common, and how are they going to be different? Again, Paul, middle grades is now reading to learn rather than learning to read. How do you see the role of using informational text in the middle grades in this respect? Well, you're, you're right, Joan. We we are reading to to, to learn, um, but uh, we still use informational text to uh, to certainly build vocabulary and to build comprehension. Um, one of the techniques that that I feel uh, works well when students are uh, reading informational text that's that, that's above their grade level, which is a tremendous motivator for kids, is um, is to of course keep vocabulary lists. But but for every scientific vocabulary term that uh, that students learn, uh, I always require them to 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 use an operational definition at at first. So you know, for example, uh, matter has a very technical definition, but we start off uh, by by just thinking of it as stuff. Uh, and and one of the, the the key areas of focus in my classroom is to help students uh, make the transition from the operational definition to the to the more formal and technical definition. Uh, and uh, and students understand that we explicitly uh, make that as a goal. And uh, when students make that transition, they're they're very proud. Uh, and then they can use the more sophisticated vocabulary, and then they then they own it. Uh, and, and I think that. Um, sort of methodology could be applied at uh, at any grade level. Uh, another piece that we often work with is uh, there's a great richness of scientific essays uh, out there. Uh, we read a piece from the uh, the lectures from the great physicist Richard Feynman uh, from when he was teaching freshman physics at at Berkeley College, and and it, it's a it's a book called. Uh, I think six easy pieces, and uh, you might think, gosh, a fr freshman college lecture, but it's uh, it's in simple language, and it's in language that uh, middle year kids can can understand, uh, and, uh, and and basically we we model the reading of the first few essays, and we view an essay, we talk to the students that, that an essay is like a, a trampoline and, and it's uh, designed to be a springboard to to their more sophisticated ideas. And if we model uh, reading and discussing a few of those essays, then students get uh, excited and, and, and really uh, develop great skills at it. Okay, I agree, Paul, entirely on that. I, I wanted to highlight um, here, the growing use of twin texts or paired texts um, also is one strategy. And this is simply the thoughtful use of complementary fiction and nonfiction books, this is something that you just mentioned, um, Paul, as part of the learning experience. So in the elementary years, using Bats by Celia Bland and Stella Luna by Janelle Cannon, but doing this in a way that demonstrates the differences between the books and the information that we can expect from them and how they might be differently organized. And, and again, you can utilize Venn diagrams, compare and contrast contrast trees, the KWL charts, and schema charts. Um, and the paired readings, as Paul points out, need not 
be full text either. Um, in middle grade, certainly that we know a portion of the text can be used complementarily um, and, and be, bring this um, to a topic to you know being more engaging. Um, and I'm thinking of things like um, Paul Fleischman's um, book on Troy, um, where he pairs um, readings from newspapers in contemporary times with the stories from the Iliad, or Davis Sobel's The Planets, um, or Longitude and pulling pieces from that. The Perfect Storm was always a great book to pull pieces from. Paul, other suggestions you have for middle grade? Um, level? Uh, yes, Joan. Uh, we, we have a lot of success uh, pairing um, science fiction with, uh, with, with fiction test, uh, text, with nonfiction texts. <laughs> um, students at the middle grade levels tend to have uh, a great interest in, in science fiction, and, and a lot of that starts with, uh, with with the video elements, uh, it can be TV shows. There's uh, there's big Star Trek and Doctor Who fans, and um, and uh, of course ha Harry Potter, and 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 so uh, it often starts with a video element or a text element. But there's great we've had great success in linking uh, science fiction with uh, with real science concepts, Joan. Okay, let's let's move on here and talk just for a minute about promoting an inquiry approach. We hear a great deal about 21st century skills and 21st century learners, and the skills that are being talked about are dependent on the use of informational texts. Our students, as they get to upper elementary grades and into middle grades especially, are increasingly expected to be able to make use of multiple texts to make sense of topics or contents, concepts, rather, um, to use primary sources, um, to act like a historian, to be a scientist. This also provides multiple opportunities that the target populations we're talking about today need to really master the vocabulary of the topic. We, we want our students to think across disciplines, to see the connections in content areas, and to look at real life situations. We want them to be critical thinkers and questioners. By using informational text as the basis for an inquiry approach, and we're talking about inquiry as explorations into problems and questions in the content area, we provide the opportunities for just these sorts of experiences with a variety of reading levels, with visually rich texts, as you mentioned, Paul, with using those graphic organizers, having the multiple sources, these can be really successful in enriching literacy experiences. And Paul, I think really this is your forte. This is where you're the master. Um, do, do you have a favorite example maybe that you can share with us about inquiry in practice? Uh, yes, uh, sure, sure, Joan. Um, I, I tend to uh, involve my students in in special projects uh, that uh, that involve uh, sometimes free inquiry and uh, more commonly uh, d directed inquiry. So, um, if you uh, if if you saw the uh, introductory slide, uh, I was holding up a. An invasive seaweed called uh, called Codium fragile, uh, and um, we did a project with my uh, middle school students uh, where we received a grant to, uh, to to map the incidence of Codium fragile um, across uh, Pleasant Bay, which is uh, an enclosed embayment here on Cape Cod, and uh, as as part of that. Uh, lesson really we um, we did a, a started with a, a sort of a blind inquiry there's some there's, there's something really great about um, topics where students don't know anything to start and so we we did blind brainstorming inquiry about why this uh, specific seaweed might be um, gaining in its uh, influence on Cape Cod, uh, and then of course uh, once they had their their theories through their through their uh, their sort of unguided inquiry, we had to comb the local and broader literature to um, to sort of assess those theories. And one of the you know one of the greatest moments that that I'll have in a classroom is when a student has has not been uh, exposed to um, an explanation from an expert, 
uh, does their own brainstorming, and then when they get to the literature, they find that the experts have had the same thoughts. Uh, and, and that's one of the most powerful inquiry moments that, that you can get uh, to, to sort of feather back to, uh, to, to Richard Feynman. One of his characteristics was that he really wanted to figure things out for himself. And, uh, and we even call that in my classroom, uh, do you, do you want to go for the Feynman moment or do you want to start with the, with the literature? So, so that, that great moment where, where students find the literature that is thinking the same way that they're thinking is one of the most powerful moments that uh, that I think can happen in a classroom. Thanks, Paul. I, before we go to questions, um, I, I did want to provide some suggestions for finding the best in informational text. Um, and I would first suggest that you really start with your school librarian or a media specialist. Um, and we've included here two lists, two annual book lists, one from the National Council of the Social Studies and the other from the National Science Teachers Association, where you can get updated lists of um, the most exceptional books in those content areas. Um, in addition to that, look at magazines. Kids Discover is a favorite of mine. There are the current events, periodicals that always come to us. National Geographic has wonderful pieces. We haven't talked too much about the social studies, but Cobblestone um, provides us with some wonderful materials. The Usborne books, Eyewitness books, Scholastics are wonderful, visually beautiful, non-fiction um, books um, for students to look at. Think of um, adult coffee table books, actually. The Hungry Planet, What the World Eats is a wonderful example of that. Um, and again, check with your librarian. They will know those twin text lists. They're also available online as well. And I'm going to stop here so that we can perhaps take some questions. Thanks, Joan. Um, Actually, the first question relates to something that you were just talking about, and that is uh, sources of informational text. And you mentioned school librarians as potential sources of informational text, and I think that's a really important resource that teachers can draw on. Um, one of our participants uh, would like you to, to talk, if you can, about how school libraries and school librarians can um, do a better job of supporting teachers and differentiating with informational text. Well, first of all, the, the librarians are our first stop in terms of what is purchased. And so, you know, having them know your needs and being able to say to them, I'm using more informational text, what is out there, and can we have more of that available in our classrooms is really an important piece of, of the partnership between both teachers and the librarians. Um, librarians also frequently offer um, uh, classes to students, and, and they too are starting to bring in more informational text, um, doing book talks around informational text. Um, coming into classrooms to do that very specifically is helpful. Um, most of the, the librarians that I have ever worked with are so passionate and so excited about text and literacy in general that if you give them a topic, they'll give you a list of books that they feel are helpful for you. Um, it would be very unusual to find anything less than that. So I think the bigger piece we need to do is keep going to them and saying, this is important for, for my classroom. Um, I'm using more of this. Can we have more available? And what do you know about it? Uh, could I address that as well? Um, so uh, one technique that I use, uh, Joan, is to, um, to actually go around to the local town libraries with, uh, with, uh, with book lists and also with, uh, and meet with the librarians and, and also with uh, a copy of our, of our curriculum uh, because, of course, it's important to have your school library uh, be uh, well stocked, but uh, one of the Great things about literacy development is if you if you can support the families and the communities and the local librarians in um, in being in sync with the educational needs of of the students because uh, there's a there's nothing more defeating for for a student than to be an excited student uh, out with their own family at their community library and and going out to to get some informational text on a project and and to just have. Uh, a, a town library that's that's just fallow and do, doesn't doesn't 
make the grade. And I found that uh, our local librarians in the towns are, are very happy to have that kind of interaction. I have to say, Paul, I really like that. Um, it's, it's another place where students are going to see models of literacy um, that see that reading is valued and valuable. Um, it, you know, we're also talking about many of these students who don't have the resources to have a huge library at home. And so this is exactly where they're going to go outside of the school to be able to find these pieces. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that uh, we had one local librarian who was just so pleased with the response she was getting from from students uh, once she uh, added some of the material that from, from our curriculum that she engaged our school and our students to help to, um, to redesign the children's room in, in the library. And, and it really all started by our going over there with copies of our curriculum. Thanks, both of you. Uh, you both made really good points. Joan, I, I love your point that the school librarian should be the first stop when we're talking about bringing in nonfiction instruction. Um, and also, Paul, the, the point about working with the public librarians is very important. Um, I'm actually a recently minted librarian myself, and I've um, talked to public librarians who say that when they start to see students coming in and they're all asking for the same thing, that they wish that they would have had a heads up from the teacher and that way they can start to pull resources together um, and, and be prepared and, and know what the students are going to be looking for. So that's a, a really great place to build a partnership. So I'm, I'm glad you made that point. Um, the next question is, uh, how does our instruction need to be different for preparing students to engage informational text in a digital format? Um, now that reading online is, is more ubiquitous? That, that's a really good question. And it brings in a whole different layer um, that, that pops to mind immediately. And that's in terms of media literacy. So we're looking for still good quality um, material in terms of non, uh, um, nonfiction or informational text. And what we have to do, as, both as instructors and, and to teach our students to do, is to be able to judge the quality of where that's coming from and how that's being presented. Um, Text online, in addition to, to drawing on, on that as a, a challenge for us, text online also tends to be in smaller bites, um, which is um, both very attractive, especially when we're working with students who are being challenged by literacy. It can be an advantage, but we want to stretch them so it can't be the only thing that they're looking at. We want them to be able to pull information that's both those small, meaty bites and um, pull information that's lengthier that goes into more narrative, that's going to use more descriptive language. And so it, it calls upon us to be able to pull into balance um, those pieces as well. Uh, there are some great online resources. I, I'm not sure I would say go online and necessarily look for um, literacy moments in the same way as I would say go online and look for sites that provide you with good um, nonfiction information. So let me offer an example. If you go to the site called Journey North, which is about migration, um, at any point in the year they are probably tracking um, 10 or 12 different um, um, species. So for example, hummingbirds right now, I think whales are on target, the monarch butterflies, um, all of those pieces. And they will have short bits that are factual. They will have longer pieces that are narrative. Um, they will have grids and graphs and visuals that you have to analyze and look at. And, and for each one of those pieces, uh, a teacher working with these students is going to have to guide them in what they're looking for and why it's important, and then thinking about that question of, is this good quality information? What's missing? And where can I find additional information for it, too? Um, Paul, uh, thoughts on this as well? Uh, yes, I can talk about uh, two two different things that, that I do in these uh, circumstances. Uh, when I have a project that I would describe more as guided inquiry, like the body biology project where uh, it's it's pretty clear what the what the topics uh, the, the the scope of the topics are going to involve. Uh, I, I will uh, do my own search, uh, um, internet search, and 
um, create a library of, uh, of sources, like the American Heart Association has some great uh, sources about the cardiovascular system with some great graphics. So, so I'll create that library uh, in advance. Um, and, and another point to make is, uh, you know, part of liter literacy education is the student's ability to to write and communicate, uh, and and students uh, generally have a very high interest in creating their own content that uh, can be can be put up into uh, into perhaps blogs or uh, links to to our website, and uh, there's a. There's an information and a literacy standard that's uh, that's really really high. Um, I just got a grant from Toyota Tapestry um, to do a to do a whale research project, and and part of the project is going to involve uh, students developing their own uh, web content on very very specific. Uh, T topics. Uh, so, so production that can be part of the, the webosphere is, uh, I think, a highly motivating uh, area as well. I have to say, Paul, I'm going to say that again and you. say. Um, I a follow up question on that, that digital topic. Um, how might informational text in digital format be advantageous for learners with special needs? Uh, besides smaller bits of info, what other features of digital textbooks and other digital sources make them accessible to those learners? I think in part um, the fact that we can, as Paul points out, we can even manage um, some of what the students are looking at so that you can um, judge the reading level and be able to make available um, those um, pieces to students who may be challenged by literacy, you know, a high literacy level. Um, oftentimes, um, they will be organized on educational sites so that they target um, particular vocabulary that's also very helpful. Um, increasingly, um, I don't think most teachers take a lesson online and simply implement it. But I think what they do do is take the best features or the ideas or um, check themselves in terms of vocabulary and questioning and so forth, and then turn those into um, lessons. And in the same way, when you send your students to a site, you can ask them to look for those features that might be most helpful in terms of supporting literacy as well. Um, Paul mentioned um, setting up um, blogging and so forth. I think looking at the format of websites and wikis, for example, and then having them duplicate those sorts of things in the same way that we used to have students make um, children's books to um, sh demonstrate their own knowledge and to build on that. Um, that's another way of them pulling apart the pieces that are in front of them on a particular website by regenerating it, so to speak, um, with their own information that can be very helpful. Yes, uh, I, Thanks, I would Jim. add. Um, the next question, uh, a teacher would like to know how to tie informational text into math lessons, um, especially at the middle grades level. Is that something that um, either one of you would like to talk about? I'll take a, I'll take a, I'll take a leap into it for a very there's there are some really good books, um, especially engaging books to bring students into using um, informational text. Math Curse. Um, I'm going to brutalize this poor man's name by John Seska. Um, Danica McKellar, with her series um, on middle grades math, um, uses real life um, sort of uh, gender um, with, the, with the, the emphasis on female interests in her books, um, but real life um, sort of um, examples to work out math problems. Um, more humorous pieces, mummy math, um, when studying ancient Egypt, um, what's your angle Pythagoras, um, the math adventure by Julie Ellis is another wonderful piece. 
Some of those are picture books that can be used as introductory pieces. Some of them actually address very um, specific skills, and you can build from that on problem solving. Um, tying those pieces in on a regular basis is, is both good for engagement, but also um, helpful in terms of, of adding content. Paul, do you have any suggestions from, from math that you may have integrated with your science units? Uh, yeah, yes, I do, Joan. Uh, one um, one uh, resource that we use excerpts from when we study uh, dimensions and uh, area and volume is is Flatland, which was uh, a, a classic really from the from the 19th century. That is a is a great um, piece about dimensions. Uh, uh, another uh, general genre that uh, that I find uh, has some pretty good math. Uh, Cross um, cr cross curricular elements is um, there. There are graphic novels that uh, talk about physics concepts and talk about chemistry concepts that are that are often very math rich. That uh, that I like to use, and I'm sorry I don't have the, the names of them, but it, but it is a field that's uh, that's that's fairly fairly rich. I've been able to find a lot a lot of those that have um, strong math content. Thanks, both of you. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, Joan, you mentioned one of the teachers that was featured in the video that's part of your article and um, how she, um, when she was talking to her students about the informational text, um, and, and these were second grade students, and uh, she was saying to them, you know, what, what would you find in a nonfiction book? And they're answering her um, index you know, the glossary, in the front, the table of contents. And it was very clear from that that she had spent a lot of time doing um, very intentional, um, explicit instruction on the, the features of nonfiction text. Um, how important is it to, to do that kind of explicit instruction? Um, and is that the case at all levels? And, and how do students benefit from that? It's really foundational um, that we are very explicit about these pieces. Um, for for the younger students, it may be the first time that they're noticing those and that this is a part of developing um, literacy in terms of the physical um, makeup of a book, um, of a text, and the differences that might exist, especially between the fiction and the nonfiction, or even those shady areas of the creative nonfiction. In addition to that, because we're talking about um, these special populations, there are often children who go for years without realizing that there is this very specific organization. So there are strategies out there for um, repeatedly going back, and it just takes literally a few seconds um, on an occasional basis to say, here we are, we're in nonfiction, or is this fiction? Um, and, then, and then looking for what would we expect to see? Where are the headings? Where are the subheadings? Could you glance at those illustrations? Are they illustrations or are they photographs? Does it make a difference? Um, what kind of other visuals are here, and how are you going to look at those to get information? And then now, let's go back and take a look at that text. Um, those are really important skills for the student to be able to set expectations about how a text is set up so that they don't spend time and energy on that piece of literacy as they go through and, and really shift their energy toward comprehension. Thanks, Joan. Um, and, and Paul, kind of as a follow-up to that question, um, you mentioned that you, you bring scientific essays into your middle grade science classes. And, um, and these are you know, college level readings. I'm, I'm curious, when you do that, do you talk to your students about the kinds of readings that they're going to be facing when they are in a college environment? And how does that affect their orientation towards the text um, and or their, their motivation to, to read those pieces? Well, I find it's always motivating to um, to let students know that they're interacting with material that is designed to be above their grade level. That's a source of great pride for for students. So uh, when we read uh, 
science essayists. Uh, there, there actually is a fairly good range of, of science essays uh, that, that can, some that can be pretty easily digestible at the middle level uh, to, to those that uh, are really designed for, for, for a college student and, and above. And so uh, one thing that we do is the first few times we, we read those, uh, we, we'll read ones that are that are more accessible. So, so we'll start with something like uh, Feynman's lecture on uh, the molecular nature of matter, which is uh, really one of the clearest uh, expositions of that theory that, that I've seen and is totally digestible by middle school students. It's, uh, it's got great graphics. It, uh, it, it focuses on the water molecule, which is something they've all had experience with. Uh, but then we build from, from there to um, to essays on topics that uh, are a little bit harder to handle, e even in the, um, the, the science textbook realm. So for example, how do you define life? Uh, you know, to boil life down to a few characteristics is, uh, is a difficult uh, thing to do. And if you, if you um, look at different textbooks, you're going to see slightly different takes on that. So we, we read an essay on that that um, we, we begin to make the point that these essays are like uh, springboards or they're like the, uh, the, the bass guitar that's laying down the, the background and, and that uh, we've got these great brains to, um, to then riff off of, uh, of the background or, or that's the trampoline and our job is to, to jump off of that. And eventually um, we train students to be very critical readers of these essays and to, to, to um, engage in a response system where uh, I tell them that if they're reading this essay in the in the bedroom, uh, I want to hear from their parents that they're they're talking back to it and that they've heard them yelling at this essay, and uh, and so we we get uh, the written feedback that way. So so we turn students into very critical uh, consumers of these essays. That's great. I I love the the image of these students kind of interacting with these texts as if they're rock songs. That's a really, really great image. And I, I think that uh, your students are definitely benefiting from, from that exposure to, to this college level text. Um, we probably have time for one more question. And I wanted to ask you both um, what your experience has been with how informational text, how reading informational text has affected students' writing skills. I think um, I think one of the most rewarding things about using informational text, um, especially with resistant readers, and um, and with boys in particular, I have to say, and that's purely anecdotal, but but especially with boys, there there when their interest is informational text, and they've been exposed repeatedly to creative writing sorts of assignments, this is a real refresh, refreshing experience for them. Um, they have something to say. It's, it's very concrete and that seems to be very helpful to some of them. Um, and so you see, you see more engagement in the writing. You see more writing, um, which is, is certainly something that's, that's hard to um, promote. And, um, the quality of writing improves the more they write, just in the same way your reading improves the more you read. And this, again, this shift can be pretty significant. Um, the, one of the students that was mentioned in the article that was, um, that was really infatuated with um, the, the science of uh, the solar system, for example, and his um, notebook that he put together um, was very detailed, very lengthy. He added to it on a daily basis. Um, he was very intent on this, added illustrations, added graphic information, and then requested the, the development of a book club to be able to share this with his peers. This was a reluctant reader. It's a second grader to see him shift from, I really don't want to do this, to being able to produce something that sophisticated and that um, in depth it is pretty awe-inspiring. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with um, differentiating through interest and then building from those strengths so that the students really produce something that's, that's exceptional.
Thanks, Joan. Um, Paul, do you have any thoughts about that? Anything that, that you can say from your experience in terms of students' writing abilities? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I would say first that uh, any of these projects that I've been describing um, have significant writing components to them. And uh, I find that students' uh, exposure to informational text adds uh, volume to their writing, it adds clarity to their writing, it adds structure to their writing, um, and, it, and it sometimes even adds uh, beauty to their writing. Uh, you know, ki kids can be a, a bit undisciplined in, in their writing um, at, at the middle levels, uh, but, but this really adds a wonderful focus to, to their writing. Um, but, but if you infuse the informational text with, uh, with these uh, scientific essays, then it, uh, it gives the, the students another model that allows them to bring their personal voice into their writing. Uh, in a way that uh, doesn't just um, feel, feel like uh, some of the undisciplined personal writing that kids do. So, so it adds volume, it adds focus, it adds clarity. Great, Paul and Joan, thank you so much for your very thoughtful remarks this afternoon, for your responses to the questions, and we thank the participants who submitted those questions. I want to make a note here that Paul's last name is actually Niles with an N, not an M. Uh, so please make a note of that. I'm going to ask everyone joining us this afternoon if you would join me in a virtual round of applause and thank Dr. Joan Barnett from Elon University and Paul Niles from uh, the Cape Cod Charter School. We appreciate uh, both of them uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to now stop the recording uh, and give you information about this afternoon's session evaluation. Thank you.